Francois Carr, most of you have seen him or heard him or you know about him. And some of you have not had the experience to be in the same room with him. And I wanted you to have this opportunity. And, and here's why. Because along the way to paradise, you run into a lot of people. And some of them are there for a season. Some of them are there for a reason. And some of them have a lasting impact on your life. And that's what he has been in my life. I've, I've known him now longer than I can say, but over a decade. And that's hard to believe. And I've had the privilege of traveling to South Africa now twice. And I've just got to tell you, every time I go there, it's a life-changing thing for me. God speaks. I see God move. I see people who are hungry for the Word, like I wish every one of our churches were. But maybe we're not. And that's why we invited him to come here today so you could just be introduced to the message that he has. He's going to talk to you something about the forgotten Jesus model. And I just want to say a couple of things by way of introduction to what he'll be saying. And the first one is a well-known passage of Scripture. It's in Matthew 28, and you know it. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we read that Scripture, and we take it. And I think we sometimes understand, but we don't employ what it says. In the Baptist church in my lifetime, I've now been in ministry 50 years. I've been doing this since about two years before I was ever born. <laughs> not, not really, but it seems that way. And in all that time, this is what I have seen in the church in America. In the church in America, we're very good with introducing people to Jesus. And we bring them into our church and we let them sit on the pew and we try to put them into a classroom where they get information. But we don't always teach them all the things He has commanded. I think in order to teach them all the things that's commanded, we have to not only just tell them the information, but we have to model the lifestyle in front of them. And I think that's where we fall short in a lot of our churches, and mine included. I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. So I believe that, I believe that the um, that discipleship, we talk about that, and that's sort of an interesting word. And a lot of times people take that word and they say, oh, I'm a disciple, I'm a disciple. We have this discipleship program, and we'll hear that a lot. Our discipleship program is spelled out like this, and you talk about classes that you give. I think it's much more than that. Here's an interesting passage of Scripture, and if, if I steal this from you today, Francois, it'll say okay for them to hear Scripture twice. It's in Mark, Mark chapter 3, and verse 13 and 14 it says, And he went up on the mountain, and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. That's actually 13, 14, 15. So if you say that, if you read that scripture in a lot of places, and you turn around and say, so what did Jesus call them to do? And this is the answers that you will get. Well, he called them to preach. And he called them to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. But if that's what we get from it, we miss what I believe is the first thing he called us to. It says he called them to be with him. And it's in those moments, it's in those times when we are with him, that we understand his voice, that we understand his heart and his mind. It's in those times when we are with him that we build relationship with him. Every one of you have people in your life that are related to them in some way. It didn't get that way by just a chance meeting. It did not get that way by just going from uh, one activity to another. Or even sitting in a class and learning some of the same scriptures. You got that by spending time, quality time, ultimate time with them. So in order to 
teach people all the things that God has commanded, we have to hear His voice. We have to know what He says, what He expects. So these are the things that have happened in, in my life through the course of these years, thinking about discipleship and trying to be a disciple, that the most important thing I can do is just take the time to be with Him. Francois Carr pointed me on that route a long time ago. And it took hold. I've never forgotten it. The most precious things I do every day is the time I spend with the Lord. I have up on the second floor of this building, we have a choir room up there. And there's a little room at the back of that. And I moved the desk out of my office. I have an office down here. This is the office wing. I moved it up there. I call it the upper room. And you can, you can leave the lights off in the choir room and close the door to that room and nobody knows you're there. Now, if I'm there too long, the secretaries come looking for me because they think I've probably expired or something. <laughs> but that's usually not the case. Usually I'm just seeing what it is that God's trying to tell me. I'm the worship and discipleship pastor here. On Sunday morning, I have the profound responsibility and joy to lead people in worship, which is leading people to connect their hearts with the heart of the Master. But the most important thing I do is not what happens on that platform. Because if I have not spent time with Him during the course of the week, none of that happens. But we can get up and sing some songs, and we can go away not remembering a thing. But it's those times when I, I'm in that upper room with Him, or sometimes I'm out in the auditorium at the piano, just me and him and the Word, and he shows me things. And it's amazing what he'll do in those times. Those are the times that he speaks to me. The last story I'll tell you is this. So my folks know this. So my mother, my mother was um, shorter than I am. People used to say we looked a lot alike. I used to give her fits <laughs> in a lot of ways. Tommy, that was a good place for you to put an amen. <laughs> but, but my mother sang in choirs that my dad led. My dad led worship in the church um, three, until three months before he passed away at age of 89 in 2019. And my mother sang in the choir. Well, my mother, by the way, she, they say we looked alike, and I, I would say well, we really used to look alike before she shaved her mustache, and <laughs> she didn't like that at all, but I said it. <laughs> so, but she, would, she had a song that she sang all the time, and she hummed all the time. Later in her life, she got dementia, and even in those moments, she would hum this song. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other. Has ever known. Late in her life, even as she was starting to go into dementia, she and I had a very profound appreciation for buffalo wings. And um, she would call me sometimes. She'd say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about making some wings tonight. Would you like to come over? I said, yes, ma'am, I sure would. And she'd say, well, how do you want me to make them? And I'd say, turn them up seven times hotter than they've ever been. And she would do her best to oblige me with that. 
And she had an automatic dishwasher, you know. But when I was there, she wanted she and I to wash the dishes together. <laughs> I always thought that was strange, but I would love to do that one more time now. And so sometimes I would wash and she would dry, or she'd wash and I would dry. And this one evening, we were finished with the wings and we were at the, at the sink and we were washing. And so I was washing and she was drying and she was just humming that song over and over. And I was just listening. And finally I said, Mama, is that your favorite song? And she said, yes, it is. And I said, why is that your favorite song? And I'll never forget this. She, folded, she dried her hands, folded up that little drying towel, and she looked up at me and took me by the collars of my shirt. And she said, because he walks with me and he talks with me. You know, Francois, I did not understand it then nearly so much as I do now. He does talk with us. Are we listening? Would you welcome our friend Francois Carr today? <clears throat> no. <laughs> I think before we start, I think it's just befitting for what uh, Scott was sharing with, about his mom this morning and the song that he was singing. Why don't we just take a moment at our tables and, and just kind of become quiet and and just spend some time as a group in different tables together and praying and ask the Lord that somehow this morning, even though we will be sharing basic principles, but this will become a moment of encounter for us too. Because we come from different backgrounds, we come from different places, we have been driven inside uh, the traffic this morning, we have seen red lights and many, many vehicles. And, <clears throat> and so sometimes as we make our way towards here, we're on the phone, and we've got responsibilities up here and all kinds of things that is just kind of inside your heart and my heart. And sometimes it takes a while just to unwind to be able. And I believe that's why God let Moses sit on that mountain for six days before he entered into the presence. Because he comes from the bottom, from the valley, from the people, from the problems. And so as he was sitting there, he started to appreciate the one who is he about to spend some time with on the mountain. And so maybe... Before we start this morning with the backdrop of the testimony, Scott, and the song that you have sang for us, why don't we just take a moment at our tables and, and just become quiet and then ask the Lord as we pray together that He would speak to us today too. Because we leave this place, we leave different than we came, not because of the common sea and the fellowship and the coffee, and the donuts. I prayed for those donuts this morning. It's, it's cucumbers now because now it's healthy. We can eat them. Um, but uh, now I tell you, yeah. But then ask the Lord just to speak to us. And as we leave this place today, um, having fellowship with one another, but at the same time living with just the truth that God has brought to our hearts, that we can ponder and linger and maybe digest. And as we leave, that this will bear fruit. It's not just about one more session or one more teaching, one more doctrine, one more sermon, but that we live different than we came because it's all about Him. So why don't we just take a moment and there are two guys here. I think this table is full of people. Maybe our Hispanic brother and our Ukrainian brother can join together. They can pray in tongues if they want. I'm sure the Lord understands, you know, Ukrainian language and the Spanish language. But uh, we can pray, and then we ask the Lord to bless us. Let's just give a few minutes, and you pray in your table. Then at some point, I will just open for us in a prayer. Then we can start. I'm going to put this off for a moment, and I'm going to join Chris at the back and pray with him, and then we will start.
Father, we thank you for the time that we can be together this morning. We thank you for the knowledge that we can know that you were the one that brought us to this place in such a time as this. And Father, thank you that we can know that we don't have to pray asking that you would meet with us because we know that the encounter with you have already started. When you've laid upon our hearts to be here, you've opened the door for us. You create the opportunity to set aside some time this morning in our schedules. And Father, we have just prayed and asking that you would help us to forget all the things that we have seen this morning, all the responsibilities, all the traffic, all the noise outside and just finding ourselves here in the place as we listen this morning. I find myself walking in the garden alone. And even as we speak that this place will be a special place this morning. Because you, because you are here. We just don't want to pray like Jacob at the end of time, but this, this was Bethel. It's like the house of God because God was here and I wasn't even aware of that. And so, Father, we pray that you would grant us just the grace of the sense of the awareness of your presence. That even as we leave this place, that we would leave different. Because you have met with each and every one of us. Wherever we might find ourselves this morning, our walk with you, in our minds and hearts, responsibilities, our emotions, our physical life, our finances, our concerns about America, South Africa, our families and children and grandkids, is that you would meet with each and every one of us right where we are. And we would leave different this morning knowing that you, that you are the one that can do all things. And so, Father, we lay ourselves at your feet, trusting that you would do something in us and through us that will bring you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for this morning, Brother Scott. Thank you for the testimony. Um, I thought for a brief moment I wanted to make a joke when you said you want to wash the dishes. So I, I guess there was a spot that you were missing when you washed the dishes with your mom. So maybe I wasn't sure. But um, I, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's good to be with you this morning. Um, I want to share something with you today. Probably most of you know me by this time about the book that we wrote about the call. And there's a lot of information around it. There's some follow-up material called How to Become a Disciple in Action, How to Be a Laborer in the Harvest, and tremendous other material that we have prepared for the people back home in South Africa. But as I was praying about this morning, what to do and how to to present this to you just as a thought and maybe because I believe with my whole heart more than ever before that Jesus Christ, the way of Jesus Christ and the forgotten Jesus model is the way forward. Because that's what we wrote about from Mark chapter 3. That's how we came here back in the day. I think that's when I met Brother Scott. We've done about 25 different pastor retreats. That's when I met Brother Paul in different places all over South Carolina. And it gave me some time to to test the waters of the material before I was able to write the book. And I'm doing something different at the moment in, in New Zealand and South Africa as a guinea pig. And if it's going to work, we will publish the next material around that. I'm working on three or four books at the same time and some other templates as well that can become a blessing for the people. But just as an introduction, we all will talk about the material later on this day. But I just want to give you a, a couple of thoughts as we go along. This is not new. I found this in a book. It's not mine. But I just want to lay the foundation because in the stats of the website, it says that 4,000 churches close down on an annual basis worldwide, but especially towards the West, which is America, in other words. 4,000 churches close down in America. And they say there's 1,000 new church plans. So we think we feel kind of good about what we are doing at the moment. But at the same time, it's bad because where are those people? 30% of the folks have returned in South Africa, and I believe in the States too, after COVID-19. They plan another pandemic called Pandemic X sometime in the near couple of months in the future. So we might see some more things which is happening worldwide. But at the same time, although it's negative, but I feel God is using that 
to bring a shift in the church between the sheep and the goats, but apart from that, is to bring the church back to really think about what is the forgotten Jesus model. Why did Jesus, how could Jesus take 11 disciples and multiply them in billions of followers while we close churches down? And that's what Scott mentioned this morning. And I think it's just time to relook at something like that. I'm going to give you a lot of stuff. Um, and some will be in the new book, and some will not be in the book. Some is just out there that you can study in your own time. Um, and so when I look at this, we, it all starts with the different models of the local church, which is called the attractional model, there's the meta models, there's the small churches. It went through all these seasons in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And nowadays, it's all about the multi-site models. There's 5,000 of those churches in the USA at the moment. Um, more famous ones, they have this campus and they say we've got 25 more campuses. So they, they live stream like a meeting this morning to try 25 different venues. And so we have this multi-site campuses like that because that's the latest thing that we do. It's all about the pastor in the front. He's the celebrity. It's all about him. It's not about the, the model of Jesus because you have to actually work yourself out of a job within three years because that's the different emphasis of Christ the whole time. So I wrote something at the bottom. Is something or someone missing in the way? We are doing church. I wrote an article about this some time ago that I'm probably going to re, uh, maybe revise a little bit and then publish that at some point because something or someone really is missing inside the local church and the world at the moment because we are missing the point. And that's just a question I was asking about that um, and the impact about this. So what are we really busy with? We are busy with the church models or are we busy with the, the model of the Lord Jesus? And so we talk about all the different models that we have I gave you some idea about this in the previous slide, but there's even more than that. It's always about this model or that model. One guy told me one day, he said, but what is your spirituality? What is the language that you are using? Nowadays, we use the word, the tribe language. We've got the tribe language at the moment. And so it's the next thing coming after the other the whole time. So it's either that or we have to look at the model of Jesus. And with that comes some problems. It's a numbers game or the end product that really matters. So what is a numbers game? So when I asked a pastor the other day in South Africa, I said, listen, what is the philosophy of your ministry? He said, what do you mean? I said, just tell me, what is the philosophy of your ministry? He said, is it all about the meeting on Sunday morning? Is it about getting people back in church Sunday morning? Is it about the offering? Is it about the finances? He said, yes. He said, but then it's a numbers game. Or is it the end product? End product is spiritually mature Christians pursuing Christ-likeness, laboring in the harvest, because that's the ultimate goal. Even when we speak about discipleship, this morning, it's a word that we use, but in, in the minds of Christian people and pastors in America, it's a different answer that you will get if I would ask you, what do you think about? If I would ask the question, what, what is the goal of the local church? You will give me a lot of things. Well, one of them will be discipleship. So let's talk about discipleship. What is discipleship? The definitions. But but then I would, I would change it by saying, what is the end product of a disciple? If I have discipled you, what would you look like when I am done with you eventually? And that's Christ-likeness. Spiritually mature people that can actually do what you and I can do. In other words, we have trained them. It's like Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas was... He's calling encouragement next to Paul, but he was doing his job so well that at some point you can back off and the one that you've trained can come to the front and get all the glory. And then you can start in a new area because that's the model eventually. It's not about you and about I. So what is the philosophy of a local church? By just asking a question like that, and the answer of the pastor will tell me already what direction this man is going. It's all about numbers, the attendance Sunday morning, and about finances. But if it's about Christian that becomes mature as followers and workers of Jesus, it's a complete different focus point inside the local church. It's not about numbers. The numbers will come as a result of that, but the focus is not that. So that means your programs, the processes that you'll be following and the events that you plan is based and aimed towards that direction. If it's not, it's a numbers game. Let's just be honest. And so that means if it's a numbers game, which is fine, it means that your focus and your emphasis inside your local church is completely different from the one that Scott just read this morning from Matthew chapter 28, which is discipleship, which is crazy. Then you talk about programs and events, or are we process-driven? And so we are process-driven. And then it's all about activities, programs, etc., religious activities, or is it equipping disciples 
and making what we call relational investments. In other words, how to invest in someone. Because when I like it, look at the life of the Lord Jesus, this is what I see. Eventually, the forgotten Jesus model is simply that Jesus took the time to invest his life and time in a small group of people that changed the world. They asked Billy Graham the same question. He said, if I can do my, my life all over before he passed away many years ago, he said, I would ask eight pastors to meet with me on a, on a weekly basis. I would invest my life and my time in them for an hour every week for the whole year, and then I will ask them to do the same thing for next year. Bill Hull said exactly the same thing in his book about discipleship, the disciple maker. And so when you think about things like this, you realize that we have missing the point completely because Billy Graham said, and that way we can saturate the whole of America with discipleship. Now I was teaching a group in, in Middleburg that Scott has been there before, but not that specific group. It was a, it's a, it's a bigger church from a Pentecostal background. And we have done a retreat like this one Saturday morning and 80 people was there. And so out of that came three different groups that we have taken them through the call for almost like a year to two years. But the pastor that has done that, he told me, he said, Francois, 85% of all the people that I'm seeing counseling on a daily basis, because he's a counselor. He said 85% of all cases of, of counseling could have been prevented if people have been properly discipled. I just met a man recently, when I, and I don't want to mention the areas and the places, but when I look at him and realize his problems, I realize this man didn't have a quiet time for the last 6 to 12 to 15 years. How to be able to hear the voice of God, to sit at the feet of Jesus and work it out for yourself. Can you imagine what will happen if Christian people become spiritually mature? Uh, there will be just a lot of stuff and fluff just flying out of the window completely. Because most of the stuff that we face today is because we don't have the Christian foundation, not as in our beliefs as a, as a, as a Protestant, but just growing to become like, just to be with Jesus. And that's the key thing. And so the forgotten Jesus model, um, one aspect of that is coming from the passage that, that uh, Scott was reading this morning, the call of Jesus just to be with him and then to be transformed by him and then to be sent for him. So the whole idea is just to learn how to be with Jesus. What does it mean to be with Christ? In, Mark, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said, you know, take my yoke upon you. And then a little word, he said, and learn from me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so I'm writing a book about this at the moment that I hope to, be, to get finished towards the end of the year. I'm already far away down the road because it's all about how do you find peace? Uh, because Jesus said some peace you will receive. Like when I accept Christ as my savior, he gives you peace because salvation is free. But when I accept Christ as my Savior, He comes to live in my heart and give me peace, what we call assurance of faith. That's what you receive as a gift, am I right? But then there's also peace that you receive when you make an absolute full surrender to Christ. But Jesus is not just your Savior, He becomes your Master. That, that we speak about the absolute surrendered life that Dr. Henry Murray wrote about. That's something different. But then there's the peace that you will find by learning from Jesus. There's eight or nine different aspects of that. And that's what Jesus wants us to learn because there's peace in the midst of the agenda by following the, the method of the Lord Jesus because we can rest. It's not about numbers anymore. It's about trusting the Lord to make the connections for what God wants to do even far beyond what we can think and dream and pray about. And, and so we want to talk about this briefly and then help us to move from activity programs to disciple-based relationships. And this is not new. There's many, many books out there I believe in America at the moment, you can read the books from Jim Putman, there's from Bill Hull, and there's Robbie Gallaty, and you can put all the books together. There's just a tremendous amount of books out there. And this is nothing new. This is just something old that God has just helped us to put together. Um, and then with that is a lot of principles that I've learned over many, many years in my walk with God that I've added to that, that makes it sound like something new. But this is not new. The forgotten Jesus model is the Father's model that Jesus was modeling upon the earth that has become forgotten. So we just want to take a moment and just reflect upon this and bring it back. And then God can use that to stir your heart and you can do whatever you want with that. And so I asked some questions. We need to learn to ask questions because Jesus was asking questions. So just a basic question. Why did Jesus do that? by calling the disciples to invent in their lives. And how did he do that? 
And the question is, what did he do and how? And, and there's one more question, where, not where should we start, but the question, how did Jesus stay on track the whole time? Because at sometimes we get distracted, am I right? So there's many questions to ask that we can learn. But this will not be in the book, by the way, that I'm writing at the moment. Some of them is inside the book, The Call. But I want to lay uh, this at your in your hearts this morning and just unpack it a little bit and then you can take it back home with you and do with that whatever you want. And I believe just the question, why did Jesus do that? Is because Jesus understood the call and the mission that was upon his life. And we need to realize this. I can give you many, many verses of Scripture. Coming from John chapter 4, that my food is to do the will of my Father. Jesus understood the call that was upon his life. And we need to realize what's God's call for the local church. One aspect of that is the heart of the Father, which comes from Matthew chapter 28, which is not, it's non-negotiable. That's the Father that says, listen, by the way, I want you to go and make disciples. That is non-negotiable. Well, we can raise up funds and build a building like this and have all the projects running and we feel kind of good about what we're doing, but it's still not the heart of the Father. And so when our meeting Sunday morning becomes a place where we can be together and worship and grow, at the same time do some follow-up afterwards that we can go out and reach the rest of America, which is not in the Bible Belt at the more, and, and, and then we don't touch the heart of the Father. We need to understand God's call upon our lives. Um, you know, when you think about the book of Nehemiah, recently I was meditating once again upon his life. But interesting, when Nehemiah was praying for four, for four months about the walls of Jerusalem that was broken down, and he asked God to give him favor in the eyes of the king. And then if you go to chapter 2, it's amazing in verse 5 of Nehemiah chapter 2, the Bible says he wanted to know that he has been sent to go fix the problem. So Nehemiah, he has a special burden upon his heart, which was the burden of the walls that is broken down. God has placed a burden upon my heart for the forgotten Jesus model for the church to explode again, just like in the days of old. But, but inside the burden is a blessing. And the blessing comes with three things. But the first thing is the fact that Nehemiah wanted to know that he is sent. He said that the king will send me to Jerusalem to go fix the problem. And I want to tell you something, there's a blessing in knowing today that we have a call of God upon our lives. We must never lose the wonder of God's call. And every now and then when I think about all the verses of Scripture, John chapter 15 where Jesus said, You did not choose me, but I chose you to bear fruit, much fruit, and so that whatever you ask in my name, I will give it to you. So we are called to bear fruit. Not just to be church, but to bear fruit. There's a call upon your life and upon my life, irrespective of all the verses that we have at the moment. So we need to understand, he understood the call and the mission. And with that, he also understand, understood his limitations. Limitations that I, I'm standing here this morning. Now, we can live stream with Chris and the ability of all the technical guys. And people can watch this from, from their homes. But also at the same time, my, watch, my wife can watch me in South Africa if she wants to. But I am here because I have physical limitations. You are sitting here because you also have physical limitations. You can only be here. You can't be at home. Um, and so Jesus, finding himself in Galilee, cannot be in Jerusalem. When he goes to Jerusalem, he cannot be in Galilee. So when he finds himself in Israel, he cannot be in Greece and Turkey. So, so what is Jesus doing? Because he has limitations, he duplicates himself in 12 disciples, and later on 72 and beyond this. And I, when I look at local churches when I'm preaching, like Sunday morning, way down in the low state, and, I, and that place was just packed out. We had two services in the morning, and I, and I just look at the members when I was there, and I just saw potential. Just imagine every member there is connected to a circle of influence around him, and what we can do is if we duplicate ourselves and we go into the marketplace and, and the businesses and the schools, what will happen if we take the presence of the Lord Jesus in a dark, dark world? Because that's actually what Matthew chapter 28 is about, to take the presence of Christ into a world that is needy. And so 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8 has become a goal for me. If you read this in your own time, you will see what I mean by that. But 
maybe we can talk about this later. So he was able to answer two questions. The question is, who am I? And whose am I? In other words, who am I? Who's Franz Sokar? What is my created identity? Now, there's a wonderful book that you can read. It's called Isolation. Uh, it's a woman that wrote a doctorate study on the aspect of isolation. Now, Dr. Robert Clinton, from the making of the leader fame and all the material about leadership development, has taken this book and said, but it's, it's one of the must-read books as a spiritual leader. But she touches on the aspect of isolation inside that. Um, what is your created identity? Who am I? Because many pastors, when they lose their jobs, they lost their identity. If I'm not standing on the pulpit preaching anymore, who am I? I mean, I'm be set aside for three months, six months because of sickness or health issues, because sometimes God puts you aside, uh, it would be called voluntary putting aside, and sometimes involuntary. There's nothing you can do. I mean, you end up in prison, there's nothing you can do, uh, but then you sit there. And sometimes you find yourself in places like this, but, but in that struggle, God strip you of who you are to come to the place of who you really are, your identity, not just in Christ, I'm born again. We go beyond that this morning. Who are you? What is my identity? Why am I put here upon the earth? You need to understand the call and the mission God has laid upon your heart without me even knowing it. Because that will bring you to a place of fruit. Because I want to bear fruit in my time management, in my preaching, in my teaching. In every aspect of my life, there needs to be fruit. Otherwise, we are just going through the motions. So who am I? It's important to read that. So a second question Coming with the first question, it's not just who, who am I, but who's, who's am I? In other words, who's the audience that you want to please? And many guys in South Africa, they, they try to keep this, this guy happy in the church because he's the one that gives a lot of money for the church. And, and this guy is the, the head elder or deacon for many, many years. And so whatever he says, it happens in the church. So you just have to step not on the toes of someone and so the way we address many issues inside the local church is because we have to, because we become people pleasers. But Jesus never was a people pleaser. He only had one person to please. That was his father. Now, if you have to take a moment just on that, which is not in the session for this morning, and start to reflect by asking questions about the last week of your life, is there a smile in the face of the father of the way we speak and behave or preach or teach? And if the answer is no, then we probably have preached for the crowd, but not for the father. And I think it's time to reflect upon our lives of who we are and especially whose we are in this moment. And then there's this question, what did Jesus do? First of all, Jesus was leading himself. Then he confided in three people. He trained the 12, he mobilized 72, and then he preached for the crowd and the masses. That's the basic thing that Christ has done. And I will give this to you as we go along. I've just added some slides. There's probably way more when you think about this, but just for the benefit of our time this morning, I think we have to be, we've got time till what time this morning? Another 50 or 60 minutes. That sounds good. Uh, I don't have a watch. We don't, you know, maybe you got the watch. I got that. That's fine. All right. So he said, that means I'm done. But if you see I'm struggling, then you must call it and then somebody can just bring me some coffee, you know, or something like this. But it all depends on the sensitivity of, of our group this morning to the Holy Spirit. If they will pick up that I'm struggling, then they will bring us the coffee. Jesus led and he were confirmed. So Jesus was actually doing something with himself. In John chapter 17, Jesus said, Father, I sanctify myself on behalf of my disciples. What's the point I want to make? is that Jesus was leading himself by doing something with himself. You can't take people higher than what you are spiritually yourself. That's the problem. If you stop growing, your people will not grow beyond this. That's why I'm constantly reading and studying and buying books and reading because I want to grow the whole time because the more I can grow, the more the people that's connected to me can also grow. This is a biblical principle. Many guys will tell you, but I don't read books and I don't have time for this as a pastor. I go in the libraries of pastors all over South Africa and America. I watch the books that's on the shelves. And sometimes it's scary to see what they are reading or not reading. Because that influences your mind. Because what you put inside is what's going to get outside eventually. So Jesus was doing something with himself for the benefit of his disciples and for his people. 
a pastor which is not growing, his people will not grow. Now you can look at all those verses, John, I think it's John 1, 37, or John 5, John the Baptist. All these things confirm the fact that Jesus was actually doing something as a leader because he's working with himself. And then he started to spend some time with the, tw with the, th with the three, and over there there's the 12 disciples. But there was the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. There were special outings with Matthew. You can read this. They saw the glory, the temptations. He prayed with them. He taught them specific things, the three disciples, that he did not speak to the others about. So there was the 12 disciples, but three of them were in the inner circle. That's biblical too. If 12 people respond to the invitation Sunday morning, the possibility of three people, which is 25% responding, that will put up the hand for you to disciple them and go deeper with them, it's a biblical thing. We always look for the crowds. Jesus said, let me just cast out the net and see who responds. And then I will spend some time with them, as you will see this morning. So he taught them. He brought them um, to his father, and they were his closest friends. He trained the 12. He chose 12 to be with him. He taught them, gave them assignments. He shared daily life, all kinds of things. So Jesus worked with himself. You know that in the 12, there are three. And some of them were late bloomers, like Philip, for instance. He wasn't in the inner circle in the beginning, but he came along later. Matthew wasn't there, but he wrote the Gospel of St. Matthew. Luke wasn't there because Luke came along in the times of Paul. It doesn't really matter, but, but the key thing is there's, there's a lots of... In fact, there's a wonderful book that you can, guys can read about, The Companions of Paul. There were 32 guys around Paul. And some of them were in the inner circle, like Priscilla and Aquila, and Mark, for instance, and, and Silas, and, and, you know, and, and Barnabas. But there's, there's the inner circle, and around them the bigger circle, and even the wider circle, but 32 in total, companions around Paul. It's the same principle. Jesus had three, 12, 72, and beyond this. In other words, he invested in them, and out of that comes the Gospels and all the letters of the New Testament. And then he taught and mobilized the seven, the 70. You know this very well. Um, we, taught, we touched on some aspect how he did that in the, in the book, The Call. We'll do some more in the, the book about the forgotten Jesus model eventually that you can learn from that if you want, but then he, he takes it wider. He's always to look to see what's going to happen beyond this. And then lastly, uh, by just asking this second question still, he was preaching for the masses because he had the public ministry until... Caesarea Philippi. Until that moment, Christ preached for the masses. Until Caesarea Philippi. From that moment, he focused his mind completely and his time only on his disciples for the last couple of months before he passed away. Um, he was still preaching every now and then, but the intention was only his disciples. And I want you to see that as we, as we go along. So how did Jesus do that? <clears throat> First of all, he was relational. He was intentional, he was mentoring, he was modeling, he was coaching, he had a specific style. Um, I have a two-page document about the leadership style of Jesus that you can study, but it's a tremendous amount of information. Christ is the ultimate model and goal for everything in our lives. But let me just give you some thoughts without going too deep in this, because we still, we still have to get to the session this morning, this introduction, um, if it makes sense to you. He was relational. By making and spending some time with his disciples, and leaders must learn how to spend some time with their trainees, with their people. I asked a guy one time in South Africa, he said, but who are this one person that you spend some time with, either once a week, once a month? He said, we meet with the elders and the, and the deacons once a month to have a, a meeting. I said, I understand that, but who is that one person in the elders and the deacons that you spend more time with? He said, every now and then we have a meeting once a quarter to talk about the business. I said, I understand, but who is that one person? He couldn't answer me. So you look at the same problem from different perspectives the whole time. Because we have to make a mindset change about the forgotten Jesus model if we really want to impact people's lives. He was intentional. He always keeps his focus on the call and the mission. We have a different session that we simply call Jesus saw, but Jesus connect because he was focusing right in front of him. Jesus saw the whole of the world but he focused his attention on the 12. He saw the whole of Galilee, but he focused on the 12. He saw the whole of Israel, he focused on the 12. He saw the whole of Capernaum, but he focused on the 12. So I see South Carolina, but I need to focus my mind, my heart, and my intention on the 12 and become intentional. With what? 
the end product of a disciple. What is that? Christ-likeness, spiritually mature people, and people that can do what I can do as a laborer in the harvest, because that's the end goal. So when I have a conversation with someone back home, I always try to keep this in the back of my mind because I know at some point I'm looking for an opening in the conversation that we can direct this towards that, that point. How can I help you to grow, to study, to be trained, and so on? He was a mentor. He modeled the relationship of his father, his life, his ministry, his calling, his conduct, his character, his style, his competence, all things I wrote about some of those inside the call, but Jesus was actually modeling that the whole time. So you can study this in your own time. And then he coached. The next point is that he was coaching uh, his disciples by asking questions. He asked 339 questions in the Gospels. When he was asking questions, then he was observing their responses. Then he was redirecting the questions. He was celebrating and he gave, there's an example of that in the, in the New Testament. You can look at this in your own time and look in John and so on. So Jesus was constantly asking. And then if there's a good response, he would celebrate. He was watching them, redirecting, because he's always pushing them in direction. Because you know and I know that if you have a problem, a counselor will look at your problem to find the symptom of the problem. A mentor will look at you today and say, listen, I think you need to do this and this. And you'll be okay. But a coach looks forward. And he's asking your questions for you to understand where you are and trying to get you to the place that you can make your own decision in pursuing that direction. Otherwise, I will tell you what to do. Otherwise, you become dependent on me the whole time. You need to learn how to depend on him. So that's how Jesus was doing things. His style, he led by example, intimacy, relationships. He was a teacher. He was a preacher. But the key thing is Jesus was transformational. And there's a book that you can actually read about this. Um, what is his name? I don't remember the name that wrote the book now. It's called Transformational Leadership. Uh, used to be the brother-in-law, I think, of Billy Graham. What is his name? I don't remember now. But it's all about the fact that Jesus is transformational. So that's... Uh, for me, it's a different word of saying, I, I want to bear fruit. I want to bear more fruit. I want to bear much fruit. Because when I bear fruit, that means that people's lives are transformed when they are coming in contact with you. Because they are, they are pulled higher, or they are convicted, or they are just exposed to something that makes them think. Because our lives should become transformation instruments, am I right? because that's who we are supposed to be. And so I think it's important to look at all these things and then, then touch on this. So let me just give you a couple of things coming from the strategy. And then I will talk about the forgotten model. We look at the processes and then you can ask questions if you want, and then we will be dismissed for the day. The unfolding strategy is just something simple. First of all, Jesus was always looking for learners. Now some, Disciple teachers uses the way explorers. Um, like, for instance, if you go to Israel, you'll find the drive all the way from the south part of Galilee towards a place called Jericho. It's about a two-hour drive with a vehicle. You'll walk for about five or six days to get there in the desert. Now, these guys, disciples, is even from the northern parts, northwestern parts, which is Bethsaida. So to walk from there down to Jericho will take you five, six hours, days of walk. And God must be doing something in your heart if you would walk five, six days in the desert to go listen to someone preaching to you about your son, whose name is John the Baptist. Am I right? How do I know that? Because eventually when they came to Jesus, they said, I think we have found the one that we were looking for. In other words, there was something happening in their hearts. And so... By looking at that, I realize when Jesus was speaking to them at, at the Jordan River, the Father was already at work in their hearts to create a hunger for something. We call them the explorers or looking for the learners, the people that puts up the hand that has a need to go deeper or to be trained or to be followed up. Now, one aspect is the word selection, is that Jesus, by the way, we look at that last night at the session, but at some point the father summons the Lord Jesus to come to the mountain. And as he spends some time with his father, 
the father gave him the names of 12 disciples and he came down and he calls them. And so it's important to pray about those people that God has uniquely brought into your life. And so they might, there's many people in my life, but as I pray about it, I said, Lord, um, because I remember when I wrote the material in the beginning, God said, Francois, I will find them, I'll raise them up, I'll send them, you train them. I wrote this down on a piece of paper. I, I should show you the piece of paper, what was the birth of the Connected Life Ministries in South Africa, because in Africa it's called Heart Cry, here it has a different name. We have a different logo here, because if you look at the logo, you can see the cross. You can also see there's five different um, the sizes of the little picture, because it's Jesus, father, mother, and a kid, or otherwise his father, mother, and two kids, or is also different levels in growth in your spirituality. In other words, some is infant, some is bigger, some is more mature, because it's a growing process around the method of Jesus. Um, that's how simple it is. Um, but when I, when I look at that from that perspective, I realize when you look at your circles and you pray about them, it's just one hand, one man can stand out that you spend time with. And he might be a stepping stone to somebody else. But who are those people in your life in the local churches? What to do and what not to do is a different conversation. And where do you start when you look at something like this? That's how easy it is. But Jesus models that you always look for the learners and you pray for them. Then if you call them, you stay with them. That's the key thing. Um, so a pastor preaching a message on discipleship Sunday morning and then look back and said, this one guy told me in Africa one time, he said, but I, I preached last month one Sunday morning on discipleship. I said, that's wonderful. What happened as a result of that? No, no, we just, nothing. Um, you stay with them because in, in the preaching on discipleship, you are casting out the net. And then five folks respond, 10 spoke, you know, respond, 12 come back and, and shake their hands and say, I'm going to be again here tonight. And then five more shows up. And that guy that's showing up is the ones that becomes hungry. So you need to make a note of that and then take them out for a breakfast or a soup and salad at Panera bread or something like this and just go and spend some time with them and just share with them the vision, the dream that you have and just stay with them until they can do what you can do. Because that's what he models. Point number three, you show them by example. Point number four, you teach them obedience. You involve them in the ministry that uh, Scott mentioned last night, the more model. You keep them going and growing. You expect them to reproduce because that's because we need to bear fruit. And then you leave them. Because at some point, they have to come to a place of being able to do what you can do. Even it scares you to death. It doesn't matter. Because now they have to, to walk with God and trust Him. So when I look at things like this, I realize this is the unfolding strategy of the Lord Jesus. And it's inside the book in a different way. And as I was praying about this, I realized there's a need specifically for the forgotten Jesus model to just to kind of put this together in a different way that we can use it as a method to teach people. And then out of that comes all the strategies that we can plan that you can actually implement in, in your local church if you want. So let me give it to you. Until now, it was introduction. Is that okay? Oh, my voice is so dry, you know. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I understand. I'm just messing. No, no, please, please. <laughs> Listen, I I wrote this down. And this is not. This is not. This is not major. I'm just saying something about. <laughs> but now that you mention it, could it be a cappuccino with a marshmallow inside? Maybe. <laughs> Probably not. Italian cappuccino with a marshmallow. Yeah. It's just a couple of peas. Let me give it to you. There's no slides about this. I'm just going to lay it out and give you two diagrams and you can ask questions. Uh, we can look at this and then we stop. I think because then you've heard enough. You rather ask questions. We talk about this and if we can help you with something like this, um, because that's what we do in South Africa. I just wrote a couple of P's because we always like C's and P's and D's and all kinds of stuff, but just a couple of P's. Um, the problem. In the problem, I, um, I put this on a piece of paper. 
these are a few things that you can take back home. And uh, the problem can just be as simple. It seems that the church have drifted far away from the purpose and the mission which was original. Let's just be honest. Um, the greatest concern is revival of God's church and God's people and world evangelization. And then Jesus comes along and put this together in Matthew chapter 9 by saying, but the need is not revival and not even to reaching the world with the gospel. The greatest need, Jesus said, is laborers in the harvest. So we need revival, but now we have this big event Sunday through Wednesday and people need to be saved and got the music and the big shot speaker coming in and all the stuff is there. It's just an event. And so we reached out with a team to South Africa, which was great, by the way. But it's just an event to reach the people with the gospel. But Jesus said the concern is not those two things. It's a concern, but the need is laborers in the harvest. In other words, we need to put those two together and realize every member inside your church is a potential laborer in the harvest. Let's train them how to become spiritually mature how to tell you what to do, how to show you, how to live by example, and then how to activate the circles of influence around them. And then we equip them, and then we leave them for God to do his own work in his own time. But at least we know this man has a meaningful walk with the Lord. So it's just a simple thing. So what is the problem? We can add, we can add a paragraph of all the churches, all the church models and all the problems, but it's not needed. We know that something, or in my opinion, someone is missing. Because Jacob said at some place, he said, he said, God was at this place and I wasn't even aware of that. So he called that place called a Bethel. So you and I can walk on a daily basis without the awareness of the presence of God. If you fast forward now in Genesis, you find way when he told his wife and kids he's going to go back because he said, he said, that night when I called to God, God heard my prayer and gave me a promise that he will bring me back. So he was actually praying when he was lying there. He was praying, but not realizing God was there. So we live daily with the, what we call the unconscious awareness of the presence of God. But on his way back, and this is interesting, on his way back, he went to the same place. It took a while to get there. In the meantime, his daughter got raped and so many other things happened because he was not going straight back to, the, to, the, to Bethel. He took a deer tour and because of that, there was a problem. But when he got back eventually to that place and he built the altar again, he said, I am changing the name of this place to the word, the God of Bethel, El Bethel. Have you read that? It's not, this is the house of God, Poplar Springs. But is God the house of God? Or is it Scott and Ken and the elders and the deacons? If it's God of Poplar Springs, this church will look different. I'm not saying it's not different. I'm just saying, you know, imagine what will happen if Jesus Christ takes control of his own church in America. So we have to ask the question, is something or someone missing? Because we go through the motions, but there's no breakthroughs. How many sermons are we preaching every Sunday in America, but there's no revival? Let me tell you something. In that Bible that you have with you, there's enough truth left to cause another revelation and reformation in, in America. If we only can read it and apply the truth. God wants to do so much more. So there's a problem. And uh, it brings us to the plan. What's God's plan? It becomes the mission. What is that? The Great Commission. Because that's what he said. He said the last thing that he said, by the way, I want you to go and do the Great Commission. Now we're going to go out and preach the gospel? No. He doesn't say go preach the gospel. He said go do discipleship, which is different. Because we focus on the word go and preach. You need to focus on the word as you go, make disciples. Which is a different emphasis completely. It's either the numbers game back again, how many got saved at the event, or how many had signed up for the life group afterwards on discipleship which is a different focus completely. So there's a plan, which is the mission. What is the purpose of all these things? What do you think is the purpose of the Great Commission? What do you think? What was the purpose of the Great Commission? Hey, Paul? It's a very good answer, but no. What's that, man? 
It's a very good answer, but no. Somebody else want to try? That's also a good answer, but no. <laughs> it's an excellent point, but no. Fantastic, but no. Come on, you're the American guys. I'm just the boy from, from across the pond. Took me six weeks to get here by boat, you know, so you know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's the glory of God. You know, it started in the Old Testament, in the book of Nehemiah, four passages. The first one, he said, he was so concerned about the city of Jerusalem that is desolated. He said, he fight with them. It starts in chapter 2. He said, in fact, chapter 1, verse 5, when he was praying, he was concerned about the glory of God in Jerusalem because Jerusalem was the eye of the Father. He said, the Jerusalem is closer to God than even Jacob, he says. So he mentioned all those verses. He's, he touches on the fact that God, his name is in the mud in the streets of Jerusalem. But then, remember when the prophet Elijah was praying. He said, Father, that you would answer me, answer me that these people may know that you are God. In the book of Isaiah chapter 43, he said that God has created mankind to glorify him. Jesus at the end of his ministry comes and said, Father, I have glorified you. It's all about the glory of God. And so I started to think about the glory of God. If I pray, I said, Father, help me to glorify you. What, what does it look like in actual practice? And so God started giving me some verses of Scripture. One of them is in John 15, verse 8, that the Bible says, And herein my Father is glorified, Jesus said, If I show myself as his disciple, in my life bear much fruit. So by bearing fruit, I bring glory to the Father. If I'm not a Christian, if I am showing myself by doing as a disciple, I glorify God. What about another verse of scripture in Matthew chapter 5? To be the light of the world and the salt of the earth, to bring glory to the Father. 5.16. What about John chapter 14, where Jesus said, and this is amazing, he said, he said, if you pray in my name, I will give it to you. Why? So that the Father can be glorified in and through the Son. It's all about God's glory. The purpose of discipleship is God's glory. When God is glorified, God work. That's amazing. So the purpose of the forgotten Jesus model is the glory of God. So you've got wonderful answers. But you know, if you, if you start wrong, you'll end up wrong. So it's, it's not about me about the programs that we do. It's about God's glory. How can we glorify God in the midst of what's happening in the world today? That's the intention. You have to think about this. Point number four, what was the pattern? What is the pattern of the, of the forgotten Jesus model? Let's just stop for a moment again and, and jump back to the Old Testament. When God gave, he calls Moses to the mountain, he gave him a pattern of how the tabernacle is supposed to look at the bottom, right? He had to do it just that way. When I think about even the, the man called Nehemiah, he followed a specific pattern. He put them in groups of 30, 38 people were, were paired together and how to build the wall. And then there were five different things here and 37 different things there. It's amazing when you look at those scriptures. There's a specific way of doing things. Now, so let's forget about this and just jump to Jesus Christ. He said, watch me and learn from me. Because Christ has become the pattern of our lives and the object of our faith. Christ is the pattern. He is the way. How did Jesus speak, behave? How did Jesus plan and strategize in his methods and all this stuff? It's, everything is about him. How did he do that? We just talked about this this morning already. In a number of slides, am I right? Just some of them. Christ, his method, finding, working in yourself and finding three and finding 12 and finding 70 and and keep on dreaming about the world, but focus what's at hand and, and just look and, and stay with them and help them to become like you. And so we see the pattern that we are missing at the moment. Am I right? This is not new. 
And then we have what we call the people. What do I mean by the people? He has his disciples, but I, I want to change it a little bit by talking about those people that God has uniquely brought into your life right now that is not disappearing. Who are those people? Um, let's take Paul McKee for a moment, or a brother from Union. And I'm just going to throw out something there. Without, If we would look at your circles at the moment, what's in your life, you start with yourself. In the back of the, the study guide, at some point you will do an exercise that looks like this, um, at this, or your circles, at one of your assignments. But if you do that properly, it becomes a way that you can actually work afterwards with that. But So you complete that circle, then you realize there's a tremendous amount of people in your life. But let's just take that person and put it aside. Let's just focus on the two directors of missions at the moment. As a director of mission, you have between 60 and 120 churches in your association, am I right? Some full-time pastors, some part-time, some tent makers, doesn't matter. But when you pray about those 50 or 60 or 80 churches inside your association, when you pray about them as director of mission, is there one or two or three or four just kind of standing out more than the other ones? And if the answer is yes, just write their names down. And then you pray, say, okay, Lord, now I'm also in my relationships, have a meeting with directors of missions two times a year. We go with our wives to Myrtle Beach and stay in the Holiday Inn and have a wonderful weekend. Or we go to the Cove, irrespective of what it is, but you meet with those guys twice a year, am I right? Now, if you pray about those 43 people, please pray. Are there one or two or three names just kind of standing out? And you say, yes, I say, write their names down. Now, as the director of mission, you meet once a year. If you go there to Chicago or Dallas, Texas or California or Las Vegas to meet the other directors once a year. There's thousands of guys, but you have breakfast, lunch and dinner. And sometimes you miss one of those because you overslept, you miss this session. It doesn't matter, but at least you know if there's a few people there that just kind of standing out. Who are those people? Write their names down. In all your conferences, you have bumped into missionaries and an evangelist from South Africa that lives in Africa, from Ukraine, from Mexico. Who are those missionaries and evangelists as a leader that is in your life at the moment? Write the names down. That stands out. Not everybody, but just those. And if I would write them down, this is not even my own personal family circles, just those circles that God has entrusted to you. You have a network at them. Who are those people? And if you pray about them, they become the people that you can impact for the benefit of the Great Commission. Because what would prevent you from inviting those pastors or those directors for a breakfast early morning or a lunch or a dinner? Give them a book as a gift and say, listen, would you be willing to spend some time with me once a month that we can read this book together? And if they would say yes, what would prevent you from doing something like that? Nothing, except time management. And willing to learn yourself, because I'm working with myself, because this guy might have a tremendous problem that I have to face. He might be addicted to pornography and alcohol and all kinds of stuff. And I'm not in the mood for this right now. But Jesus is always in the mood for you, am I right? It's the same thing. So, and by the way, it's not you counseling, it's him counseling. I don't have to be all the things for you guys. I just have to be available and be willing to listen and to go the distance. What would prevent those guys in those circles? And this is not mean when I think of you and Paul. I'm just saying how easy it is to make a circle, not even touching your own, and then just start to lay it out there. That's how simple the method of Jesus is. Paul, Paul the apostle took that method and he put it to the ground to the T. And somehow we have defaulted back to church in America. It's all about replants. In fact, this is also a revitalization source if you want, and also a new church plant. What is the place? It's in the material about laboring in the harbors, but the place is where you start. This is Jerusalem. You start where you are. Now we got to go to Africa and do some work in, in Nigeria. No, I'm starting right where I are. My Jerusalem is right here this morning. So you start where you are. Who are those people in your life right now where God has placed you 
that he's just extending. Now, some places might be beyond the, the borders of America, and you have to coach them online, which is fine, but you spend some time with them. But the, there's a place. Nehemiah put the people in front of them in chapter 3 and chapter 4. They work according to, right in front of them, their homes. The potential, you can read about this in the front here if you want. Um, there's a process. We'll talk about this now. There's a promise, the wonderful promise that God says that if you do this, what will happen? He said, I will be with you. Till the very end. There's a man called David Livingstone. The night he struggled on that river bank in Africa, when the tribe leader looked at him and said, when you cross that river tomorrow morning, I'm going to kill you. He has 120 people in his group with him. And so that night he, he was praying, he wrote in the front of his Bible, because God gave him Matthew chapter 28. He says, go into this world. He said, this is the word of a gentleman of the highest order. And to that, there's an end, he says, from the beginning to the end. The word of a gentleman, that God says, I will be with you. Isn't that wonderful? That the creator of the universe will be with you when you do what is in his heart. He gave a promise for that. And then he brings us to a prayer of commitment, which will be in the book eventually, I think, that we can sign. Let's just look at this briefly, the process. There's two ways of looking at this. Um, it's, it's wide going down, and it's also at the same time, it's small going wide. So let me just talk about this, and then flip it around, and then you can ask some questions if you want, because then I'm done. Um, I did this a long time ago, so my son-in-law said, he said, he said, Dad, you can't just change it. I have to change it for you. Um, so maybe somebody can build us something new that we can play around a little bit. But basically, what I'm doing this morning in the common sea is I'm casting out a net. It's like catching fish. I'm just throwing out the net in order to expose you to something that you already know. But maybe God uses it this morning just to stir your mind and your heart a little bit. Um, so this is all about just casting out a net. Um, that we can come to a place of seeing what is the assessment, where are you, where can we stop, what to do, what not to do. Is there people in your life at the moment when we do a circles? Is there groups that we can help you with? Can we do a retreat? Can we do a course? Can we do a presentation? Can we do a breakfast? How can we help you? It's just an assessment. But let's say people respond and say, okay, we want to, we want to do a weekend retreat for two or three days. We get 20 or 30 or 50 odd people coming for the weekend. We train you through the material on a Saturday morning from 9 till 12, three or four sessions. It's just casting out there. We go through the material, and then for the next couple of weeks, you can read this in your own time. You can meet on a weekly basis. There's a church in Namibia that has gone through this for 52 Sundays. He preaches every Sunday morning out of the material, the principles. He makes his own message around that. They typed it out, and in the small groups on a weekly basis, they discuss all the questions. They've gone through that for 52 weeks. So they're in the second one. They're doing the forgotten Jesus commands at the moment as a guinea pig because we want to publish something about that too, how we connect the principles with the commands of Christ um, for the future. So they're busy with this at the moment for 52 Sundays. One just started the other day and said, we'll go for 12 Sundays or 14 Sundays or 16 Sundays in a row. So the weekend you start, and usually what happens is because 25%, three out of the 12 disciples from Jesus came back, is in the inner circle. So we know if you train 24 people, probably six or 12 will return to go deeper. Am I right? If you've done the whole weekend retreat and for the whole year, it's fine, because at least we know they have a quiet time. They can hear the voice of God. They have a journal that they write their quiet time. They have done their circles. They know that God has put them here for a reason. So you have you brought them into contact with God and with people around them and with yourself, which is fine. But let's say eight people return or 12. We take them deeper and train them what we call the connected disciple material, which is all about how to become an effective labor in the harvest. There's between eight and 12 sessions that you can learn online or we can give it to you or we can teach that for you. Now let's say out of that group, 
say, listen, I, I want to go deeper than this. Then you take them into leadership development. We also have 12 sessions about that. In the meantime, you grow through become a convert, becoming a follower of Jesus, become a laborer in the harvest, becoming a leader, just the way Jesus has done that. We have supplementary courses about coaching, how do we do evangelism, books that you are reading at the moment. And so when we leave you after three years or so, then you have developed your people from where they are to where they want, where God can use them tremendously. That's the process if you start that way. But let's just flip it around to start in a different way, completely different. Let's say we start with the circles. And you are sitting here this morning and said, okay, but where do I start? So we can either arrange a conference, Scott can come speak and Paul can present and Greg can come or we can arrange the schedule sometime and whatever. But let's say we start differently. Let's say we make a list of our circles. I said, Lord, um, this one guy is in my heart the whole time. So we have breakfast. We meet at the Panera Bread once a week. We are reading through the book together, five or six pages a week. It takes a long time. It doesn't matter. But I'm investing myself in this man's life. Now at some point, let me just tell you something. With a group in South Africa, we have come in the book to this place. To this place of the circles. This one here. And so we present this. And so they said, okay, you have to do your circles. I'll see you guys next week, next Friday, because I met this group of 12 people every Friday morning at six. And so they said, we've done the circles. What comes next? I said, no, show me your circles. And so they, we were busy for five Fridays, lit into a six Friday to make sure that the circles has been done. Because now you, have, you, are, you see the names. And as I look at the names, I wrote the name down here. Let's say Paul McKee, for instance. Um, no donuts for you today. By the name that you write down, you really know what that man's problem is, or his need, or where he finds himself in his walk. I wrote the name down here, so and so. This man is an alcoholic. This man here, addicted. This man here, young Christian. This man. So by the writing the names down, you already see what might be the need around that person's life, marital problems, divorced, whatever the case might be. And, and so I kept them accountable for six weeks to this before we moved on, because you need to do that. And then the question is, how many of those people, by doing something like this, you will complete this? Okay, but let's pray about your circles. Are there any three people just standing out that you know has the potential? He said, yes. I said, who are those three people? So he mentioned the names and said, would you invite them for a cup of coffee in a donut? And he said, yes. And so this guy has now three people. And he said, I, I just talked to them. I'm scared to death. I said, would you be willing to ask them if they would read this book with you for next year? And they said, yes. And so he bought three books. So now I'm working with, let's say, Paul McKee sitting here. He was following the material, and now this guy brought three people. And so the moment Paul starts to work with them, he becomes a worker, not a follower anymore. Those three people become his followers, but he became a worker. And so that means I need to spend some time with him as a worker, not as a follower anymore, because he needs to learn specific things how to do that. If you do that properly, at some point, those three guys will go through their circles and they will say, okay, there are people in my life, three people, three people, three people, it's nine people, plus the three that you have gone through, it's 12 people. But the moment they invite them for a cup of coffee or a breakfast or something, I said, I will go through this again. That man becomes a worker, but now Paul has become a leader of three workers. Because churches, the problem today in the church, I believe in America and South Africa is as a, as a pastor, we are all leaders of followers. We need to become leaders of workers and leaders of leaders. Because elders and deacons is potential leaders, not just following the vision of the church. It's just workers that needs to be trained. And so we can flip the white. We can flip them around at the same time by starting small and building exponentially. And at some point, the Timothy principle is, is Francois, there's Scott, there's Paul, 
is there three people, if they can do what Paul can do, it's four generations. Paul, Timothy, go find someone who can train someone, it's four levels. Once those people that Paul is training and Scott can do what we're talking about today, I can disappear. Because then he becomes the big shot for the next four generations, bottom downwards, and then he will disappear. Because that's what Jesus has done. At some point, this will be a movement worldwide and nobody will know where it started because that will give him the more glory. And so we can start broad by casting out a net and start to do something, or we can do that and we can do the small start at the same time and let the Lord grow this exponentially. But in the growth of that, you grow as a leader because now you lead followers to become mature. Now you lead workers and now you lead leaders. So you grow yourself, then you become a presenter. So that's the process that Jesus was following. He did this, but at the same time, he also did this because he cast out the net at the Jordan River. People were exposed to him. He was preaching from town to town, from place to place, casting out the, the kingdom of God. And those who responded, he pulled in. So we do two things. We do this and this at the same time, because that's the process. Any questions about this? Or something that you'd like to add. What time is it now? Not not time for the horn yet. Nine, Nine minutes. Any questions that you guys want to ask or want you want to add? If we are missing the point, you must tell us I'm fine. I am small enough that I will confess and then take my bag and leave. It's fine. <laughs> but I hope that the Lord can start a stirring in the hearts. Uh, I'm not looking for work. But I, can, I, I just feel in my heart that if God can start a group that can duplicate itself in our nine states of South Africa, we call them provinces back home. And we have 42 different regions in those nine states. And then we have the, the, all the states of Africa. But just imagine, this is nothing new, but if there's a group duplicating, multiplying in every state of America, every association, every town, every church, that wants to be and to like and to talk and to behave like Jesus Christ more than ever before. We say that with a mouth as Baptist people, but our actions shows different. We spend hours watching ball games. We spend hours watching TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube movies and all kinds of stuff. I don't say this is wrong. I just see that as a waste of time because we are wasting time. And somehow it's free not to be addicted to all kinds of technology. Just have time to smell a rose and to watch a sunset and go out for a walk, drink a cup of coffee with your spouse in a coffee shop. Just be together, enjoy. And always just watching a ball game because our default back home put on the TV and set. Twelve at the most. Um, if you if you present it and you go with them through twelve, I would I would do the teaching, but I would not see that as my discipleship group. I would see that as my casting off of my net. And as I'm busy with that 12, I will keep on looking to see which one of those 12 get it. And he's always asking something. And then he said, okay, just, he said, listen, can, let's drink some coffee, Starbucks and have a biscuit or something and just kind of throw it out there. And just start to become intentional by spending extra time with this guy. Because once you go through the material, that guy becomes your next small group leader without you knowing it. Um, so I would think if you do 12, it's like, just see the self as a casting of the net and then see who responds. But I would not go beyond 12. If you have more than 12, I will do the short devotional teaching and then divide them sitting around the tables and put them in groups of four, 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 and then discuss that. But even if I do that, I will change the method in around the table. 
what I will do is, for instance, let's say um, you guys, yeah, this, this table, it's Paul, Keith, myself, and one more person. I would change the method by doing something like this, by saying, okay, let's number the group one, two, three, and four, and then you divide, when you go to the study material, you, you let them ask questions according to the numbers. In the leadership guide, I've got some of those examples. In other words, then Paul would ask a question, what did we learn this morning? He would ask the question because he's number one, but all four has to answer. And then number two will say, okay, what did God speak to me about this morning? He would ask the question, but all four would answer. And so by the end of that session, there's in every session, there's 12 questions. So that means you can have 12 times four, you've got 48 different answers. If it's just a big group, two guys will speak and this will keep quiet. The intention is to grow them. And so what you do around here is you force them to speak, to ask a question, to speak before people and to be transparent with your answer. So you are growing at the same time. So that's what I would do. And I won't go through all 12 questions in one evening. I'll just do four. And I will come back next week with the same teaching and go for the second levels until we have done the session because there's no time limit in discipleship. Because once we have done that, it means I taught the person how to speak before people, how to ask a question and how to be transparent and be able just to share something from his heart. So you teach them how to speak before people and they learn the quiet time and all the stuff. So at the end of that course, you have grown tremendously, but it's not the numbers game. It's what? Spiritually mature people. Because once I've done that, it means I have potential workers in the harvest that I can invite because all this four. The last time when I came here, I think um, uh, somebody drove me all the way from, from Atlanta. Um, I want to mention the guy's name and where he's working, but his wife spoke to me a long time in the vehicle about discipleship. So I asked her, if you take a little book called Connecting Time About Quiet Time, do you know of six women in your church, which is a mega church, by the way, that might be interested in learning more about quiet time? She said, yes. I said, can you invite them for tea and cake? And she said, yes. I said, would you be able to buy them a book each and gave that to him and said, would you guys want to read this book with me for, for the next, because there are only six chapters, one chapter per week. She said, I can do that. And then at some point in week, week four and five, you, you ask the question and said, but do you girls have like three or six girls around you that might benefit from this. And they would probably say yes. So let's buy them five books and bring them also for tea. But the moment you do that, you move from a follower to become a worker without you knowing it. And so now you have to make sure that you check on the goals that meets by reading a book together. And by actually just reading a book together, you are already busy with discipleship. That's how simple it is. But it's always towards the end. You said, but is there other people that might benefit from this? your circles. If you don't do that, we have just done a Bible study, but we want to move into helping other people to grow. Does it answer your question? Yes. Okay. Somebody else? So I wanted to ask you something. Uh, you have, a, you have a, a unique perspective because of your work here and in other parts of the world. Uh, and I just, I just want to know your opinion what do you think? What do you think is the biggest obstacle to this life in America? To this in America, and how does that compare to other parts of the world and the obstacles that they're facing to, to make this happen? So, what what do you see in, in America? What do you what do you see as keeping this from, I guess, revival or this you know to see this happen? Just a mindset, change of a mindset. I can talk about the ball game. I can talk about the mall if you want. I can talk about all the stuff which is out there because we always preach about people addicted to the ball games and all this stuff. But let's just be honest, it's just a mindset. When I was preaching one time in, in Wales, not Wales, in England, southwest and part of Wales, I met the superintendent from the Methodist Church. He said, why are you in Amer here, uh, not in America, but here? I said, I have to speak at a conference about revival. He said, oh, so what is the definition of revival, he says. Oh, before I was able to answer, he said, oh, probably Charles Finney from America, he says. If we do this, God will do that. I said, no. It is the word that George Whitfield says. Oh, that thou would render the heavens and come down. 
And so I'm here because I want to create in the hearts of the people here the O, oh, to long for God to do something fresh and new. So I said, by the way, what are you doing to create an O in the hearts of your people? He said, no, that's the end of our conversation. So he walked away, you know. And, and so when I realized something like this, I realized that a great deal of churches in Europe base their theology on the sovereignty of God. If God was to change America, he will. And so at least let God do his own thing in his own time. Um, the American mindset is, if there's a problem, let's just fix it. So because you've got resources and money, it's easy to just start a new program and just fix it. Because it's something that you can do. Well, this has to do with an intimate walk with the Father, according to His agenda and schedule, that God will provide His own time, His own money, His own ways. Um, let me give you one more example of that. Um, Andrew Murray used to say that the greatest hindrance for revival is the fact that we have exchanged intimacy with, with church and Bible reading and prayer. Although we speak about reading your Bible and prayer, it's not that. It's that you hear the voice of God this morning when you read your Bible. And so we have to realize that we can, we can default back to Christianity and activities, or we can have intimacy. I spoke to a man a few days ago. In the conversation, I picked up we haven't had a quiet time in 12 years. How in the world? But you go to church every Sunday. Um, and then I realized the church that he's sitting at, and he, and he talked to me about the pastor, the pastor is not modeling and helping his people to walk with God. That's the problem, actually. It is a leadership problem. It has to start from there to go down to the bottom. So let me close. In those little things I said, Lord, you will find them, I'll raise them up. I was praying about John 13, verse 20. And I wrote down, I mentioned last night the circles of Jesus in the prayer life, and I look about all kinds of things, but I haven't touched on that last night, but when I pray, I have three different focus points. And one focus point is John 13, 20. So I mentioned that at Greg's church last year when I was here. On the top, it's four things, but the top one is, Lord, is that you would send your chosen ones to me whom you want me to disciple. So my spiritual job becomes to pay attention to who comes in my life. I need to learn how to pay attention. I need to learn how to believe God will send the right person at the right time. So if you come in my life today, I don't, I don't doubt that God sent you to me, but you might be an alcoholic or a drug addict, and I don't want to work with you, so I would just you know, back off and make an appointment with somebody else. But I believe that, I trust the Lord, that He has a way of connecting. And so my spiritual work becomes, how do I pay attention? How do I learn to watch, to observe, to take notice? of the people in my life. And the moment I make that connection, how do I adjust my schedule to come alongside this man? Because obviously God wants me to do something with this man. So if you learn, so to answer your question, I think it's an intimacy problem in America. I can, we can speak about, because you don't pray, look what's, what's happening in the States. But let me say, let's just change that and say, okay, but if we spend time with the Father and we learn how to to hear his voice and respond, look what can happen. So we can either say, because you're prayerless, look at that, or we can say, but when you connect, look what can happen. So let's create, let's know the problems in the States, but let's focus on something different. <clears throat> now do I know that, Paul? On the trip to Turkey, you remember, we came to a place called Ephesus, and John the Baptist, not John the Baptist, John, the beloved disciple, was put in prison in Patmos. But if you read Revelations, you find that John never said, said something negative about the Caesar that put him there. He said, I find myself in this place for the tribulation for the name of Jesus Christ. He never mentioned a man's name. We are quick to point the finger and call names. It's time to focus on the Father. He knows what's happening in the politics in America, South Africa. He's still got this. And everything is part of God's bigger plan for the coming of His Son. So we have to become God-focused and not... And the problem for that is intimacy. We don't know the Father. That's the problem. We know church and religion, but not the Father. Good word. Yeah. Any questions? Then I... Then you can blow the horn as long as you want. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. You did? Yeah. So you're checking now. No, I'm just guessing. <laughs>
Any more questions? We would gladly help you guys in your association or your churches. Uh, but my job is not to find work for myself. My job is to help Scott and Paul and Keith and all of us grow together as a team and as a group and then develop other people that we can all become connectors and training people all over America that the Lord can use this to become a blessing for people. And But we start where we are. And uh, even Ukraine, it can start here in the church of the Ukraine people and go beyond and go back to the people that side too. Yeah. Then I'm done. Good.